So greetings everyone and uh, welcome to the 104th session of the online optom learning series or OLS and it gives me a immense pleasure to you know introduce uh, uh, not one but two of our esteemed speakers onto our platform today. Uh, so today we have uh, Dr. Melissa Barnett and also Dr. Tom Arnold or Thomas Arnold uh, as, as the name goes. And uh, Dr. Melissa Barnett is a principal optometrist at the University of California, Davis Eye Center in California. She is an internationally recognized key opinion leader who specializes in dry eye diseases and specialty contact lens. She lectures and publishes extensively on the topics of dry eye, anterior segment diseases, contact lenses, and most importantly is the healthy balance between work and home life for women in optometry. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Certification in Medical Optometry, a fellow of the British Contact Lens Association, BCLA, and also a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. She also serves on the board of the American Optometric Association Contact Lens and Cornea Section, the Gas Permeable Lens Institute, which is the GPLI, and she is also in the International Society of Contact Lens Specialist and a past president of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Uh, Dr. Barnett and Dr. Jones have authored and edited the book Contemporary Scleral Lenses, Theory and Application with Unique Perspectives and Contribution of International Experts. She is also awarded the inaugural THEA Award for Excellence for Mentoring by Women in Optometry and she was granted the Most Influential Woman in the Optical from Vision Monday in 2019. And I think I'm not sure where does she get the spare time with all this work she's doing, but during her spare time, she actually enjoys cooking, uh, performing yoga, hiking and spending time with family. So uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Melissa. Uh, it's the first time you are here onto our platform and thank you for giving us this time. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Yeah. And uh, with uh, Dr. Melissa today, we have uh, Dr. Thomas Arnold. Uh, he has been with us in the past for one session uh, where he took us through tips and tricks about uh, ocular photography of the anterior segment. Uh, Dr. Tom uh, is a private group practice owner, which is known as the Memorial Eye Center in Sugarland, Texas. He is a graduate of the University of Houston College of Optometry and also a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. And during his training, he has participated in vision outreach programs in various countries, such as Mexico, uh, with the Bureau of the Indian Health Service. He has spent two years as a research assistant for the ETDRS group, which is the Early Treatment Diabetic Retinopathy Study Group at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston. He is a passionate scleral contact lens fitter because of the ability which helps patients who are struggling uh, with vision and the lenses provide them wonderful vision by you know, placing them onto the eye. He is also uh, lecturing extensively in international platforms, international speaker as well and presented in various countries which includes Russia, Poland, India, UK, and major meetings in the US. So uh, welcome Dr. Tom again uh, onto our platform. Uh, thank you for giving us your time as well. Thank you. And together, Dr. Barnett and Dr. Arnold are also a co-host of a very popular uh, podcast channel, Globalize. Uh, we have had uh, the opportunity to here, I think five or six of the podcasts, and I, I was just chatting with both of them. There are many podcasts lined up in the series where, you know, they interview uh, optometrists globally and find out the perspective of optometry in their country and how optometry is. 
and they are also co-chairs of the International Congress of Scleral Lens Contacts, which is the first ever meeting globally dedicated to scleral contact lenses only. And I think uh, the 2021 meeting is where is in July 23rd, 24th in Florida. I think I leave that uh, discussion with you and you can let us know about that meeting as well. And today, uh, Dr. Tom and Dr. Melissa are going to talk to us about conjunctival mysteries on, uh, you know, uh, how we should go about looking at the conjunctiva while we are fitting scleral lenses. So thank you so much, both of you once again, and uh, let me just uh, leave the screen time to you. Well, thank you so much again for the kind introduction and thank you all for attending. It's always a pleasure to lecture with Tom. So thank you, Tom, for joining me as well. So we do work with multiple companies to grow our wonderful profession. And today we're gonna be talking about the conjunctiva. And when we start fitting scleral lenses, we notice that the conjunctiva is not perfectly regular. There are lumps and bumps. Now that could be a pinguecula, it could be a cyst, it could be a glaucoma drainage device. And the reason why this is an issue is that it can interfere with the fit of a scleral lens. We can get inflammation in that area. We can get atrophy in that area. The patient might say, my eye's red, it's uncomfortable. So years ago, when we didn't have some technologies, there were a few different strategies. So we could vault over, go over whatever that elevation was. We could kind of like push down on it and make it go away, but it doesn't really go away. Um, we could also go much smaller in lens diameter to try and avoid it. But now we have various technologies that we're going to talk about today to align scleral lenses. And I will say this time in 2021, it's the most exciting time for fitting scleral lenses. And I think, you know, fitting lenses has changed lives over the years. It's been absolutely amazing. But now we have technologies that we're going to talk about today. And so fitting scleral lenses is still so exciting right now. Now we know that if a patient has say a glaucoma drainage device or an elevated bleb, we don't wanna interfere uh, with that at all. And we want the lenses to align evenly on the scleral conjunctiva. So years ago, we had the opportunity, and we still do have the opportunity, which works very well in some patients, to notch the lens. So here you can visualize the notch that is actually made in the edge of the lens. And what this does is it allows the scleral conjunctiva just to just flow evenly and it doesn't constrict blood vessels or anything like that. This picture on the right, you can visualize a patient of mine who had glaucoma. This was a 15-4 diameter lens. As you can see, it's a little bit smaller um, than I would normally go. And the lens is notched there uh, to avoid the elevation. We can also do vaulting within a lens or at the edge of the lens, which is called focal vaulting. So it can be say within the lens for Salzman's nodule. It can be on the periphery for any sort of those elevations that I just mentioned, a pinguecula, a pterygium, a glaucoma drainage device, really any sort of scarring from strabismus surgery it could be any sort of elevation. It's a spherical elevation that's created centrally inside the lens, and then a hemispherical ripple that's created at the lens landing zone. So it maintains that circular shape of the lens edge, and it can vault over a variety of things. One tip I'll share with you is that when you're incorporating this in your practice, so either a notch or a, any sort of peripheral elevation or vaulting, is to inform not only the patient, the location of it, say three o'clock in the right eye, but also whoever is teaching the patient how to apply and remove the lens. And I like to tell my patients that this is purposely there. Otherwise, they might say, oh, there's a defect or there's an error in the lens and to know that, no, this is actually a really highly customized lens. So there are various technologies from different companies. This 
is the microvault technology. And as you can see these beautiful pictures here, you can see at the bottom left image, that area of elevation there of the microvault. And again, that's what I would tell my patient. This goes right at that specific location. The images on the right, the pinguecula, you can just see with the microvault how beautiful the blood vessels flow and how it does not affect the pinguecula at all. This is another company. Uh, you can see the Edge Vault. Uh, and these are just also just beautiful images where it vaults over that area of elevation. Yet another option is the controlled peripheral recess, which creates just a precise, beautiful area. This picture, credit of Tom, with his many beautiful pictures, as you can see, it shows how that lens lands just evenly on the scleral conjunctiva. Yeah, so the, thank you, Melissa, and, and thanks for uh, sharing this time with me. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you again. Um, yeah, there's many different technologies here, and this is this is one application of what you were just describing. I fit this lady uh, not too long ago, and everything was fine. The vision was fine. The fit was good. But she described she, we did have a problem in this area. And we can see that in the next slide uh, that her complaint was the wearing time was great. And she stated that uh, the, the vision was very, very good. And the comfort was good, but her main complaint was and her eyes were no longer dry, which is one of, one of the issues. But she, her main complaint was, yes, but my eyes get red, All right? And you can see right there, you know, especially in the corners. And what you always want to do, and this is one of the tips we want to share with you, and at all your follow-up visits, you want to remove the lens and look at the eye. You look for rebound redness. You look for depressions uh, where the edge of the lens might have made in the conjunctiva and put a little fluorescein in and that fluorescein will reveal uh, any areas of impingement. And that's what you can see right in here. So um, you take the deep dive and you can see where the lens is impinging. So what do we do about it? Uh, it's, you know, it's right there. Very easy to see. Well, what we used to do is what Melissa described uh, in, the, in the early days is we used to just take a notch out of the lens and you could do this in your own office or the lab could do that. And a notch is, is just a cut out of the lens. Uh, so you end up, I think there's another arrow here, Melissa, that in indicates that. Uh, yeah, on the upper right there, there's a tube shunt, uh, just like your patient, uh, Melissa, that you described a minute ago. So we're trying to avoid this shunt uh, and we did that by notching it. But you can see the middle image there. You can see what a deep notch that is. And the problem with that is that you go into the thicker part of the edge. And so it's not even, and you can introduce bubbles into that. Uh, and it may not be as comfortable as it otherwise might be. Um, I'm going to just chime in on the notch here because yeah. a common question is how to notch. Um, so just going over how yeah. to notch. Um, so you have an elevation, whether it's a pinguecula or pterygium, whatever it might be. So you can actually measure that elevation without a lens. You can measure the height and measure the width. Then you can put a lens on the eye and you can actually take a Sharpie or a black marker. And I like to tell my patient that I'm marking the lens and not their eye yeah. and actually drawing an area of where I want to notch. And then you can either take that measurement and tell the lab or directly send the lens to the lab using anterior segment OCT. You can also measure the depth that you kind of want that notch to be or that elevation. So those are just some helpful hints um, when we're notching or in including elevations in the lens. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's, that's true. And now we can do, we have some other techniques uh, like for this particular lab, not all labs do this, but what I enjoy about this particular lab is that you can describe the lens, use their calculator, put it in and then, you know, record the results. So this is a very precise way of doing it. And this, this is not a notch. This is what they call controlled peripheral recess. So you'll see, I think in the next image, it's different than a notch in that this goes right into the edge of the lens. 
And so it's an, it's an elevation, more like the microvolt that you uh, illustrated a few minutes ago, Melissa. Uh, so the edge thickness remains uniform. The lens diameter it remains uniform. And this is an elevation uh, that is made over you know, your area uh, that's being impinged or elevated. And it has a nice little uh, marker, the little hash mark you can see if you look closely. So this is, this is a, an advanced technology that some lens uh, may offer. And I think that's why scleral lens fitting right now is so exciting is the scleral profilometry that we have. So we have this ability now to measure outside of the cornea, outside of the limbus, onto the scleral conjunctiva to make these lenses even more precise than we could ever before. Yeah. Yeah. You can quantify it. You mentioned profilometry. You actually can quantify it. Uh, and here's the right eye. She had bilateral uh, pingueculas. And you can see what a nice even edge that is and how the conjunctiva, uh, the blood vessels are not impacted at all. So this, uh, this was a problem solver for this particular patient. So another problem solver is the iPrint Pro. So this is an impression-based technology. So it's a transparent prosthetic scleral device that matches exactly the contours of the eye. So I like to talk to my patients and tell them that it's a very customized technology, like the most custom fit glove or dress or whatever it might be. And it is used to create the best vision and comfort possible for a patient. So you can see the impression or the blue goo. And I don't know about you, Tom, but I, I feel like I always get more messy than my patients do with this. They have a little bit and somehow I get it all over my hands. Um, but <laughs> it's kind of a messy process. It's but here you can see... It allows for a really precise uh, lens design. This impression here is gorgeous. And what we've learned over the years and from many of our colleagues that are teaching us, and I, I'm going to share this with you because you can see in this impression that the horizontal visible iris diameter is much larger than the vertical visible iris diameter, which is what we're seeing in many patients. So I'd encourage you to actually look, and I'm noticing this all the time, not just in contact lens wearers or scleral lens wearers, but just patients that are coming in that the HVID is larger than the VVID. And so then the impression is scanned and a very precise lens is designed for the patient. And here you can see the lens that is really unique. So in my clinic, I'm using this for patients that have really elevated blebs, very irregular corneas, those that had some sort of problem or issue with a prior lens, maybe their eyes were getting red or they weren't comfortable, or there was just one area that could not be perfected. So now that we have scleral profilometry and impression-based technology, it's a really exciting time because we can make better lenses for our patients. So this can, these are just some examples of really complex eyes where this technology can be used, but it can also be used not only for scleral lenses, but also for corneal gas permeable lenses. So you can see here that sometimes we have corneal GPs that come off the eye, they dislodge, they're not fitting just where you want them to fit. And in my clinic, especially those patients who have had corneal transplants, those who have pre-existing corneal edema, where I just, I'm really hesitant and I don't want to fit a scleral lens, corneal gas permeable lenses are a great option. And sometimes those eyes are really challenging where the lens doesn't sit quite where I want it to. So previously we could do things like piggyback the lens, we could put a soft lens on and then the gas permeable lens over. We could, you know, make it so it was okay, but now we can make it even better with this customized technology. That's great. We use iPrint in our office as well for those really challenging fits. And I, I can tell you, Melissa, and I'm sure you may agree that those are the happiest patients because a lot of people that come to us for iPrint have had scurls before and they, they like the vision, but maybe, as you said, the comfort's not where it should be or their eyes are red or, you know, they're, they're, corn, they're landing the scleral topography is too irregular. And boy, you put them in a, an eye print 
and it's it's just the best thing. So those are very rewarding patients. Really enjoy that. Uh, this next patient is probably a lot more typical of most of the patients we see, and probably the same in, in most everyone's office. So here's a 39 year old male who was only diagnosed five years before I saw him. So fairly late, and unfortunately, this this is common as well. Where keratoconus is missed in the early days. And, and we can talk why that would be the case. So he's a salesman. Um, he comes from a town about 120 miles from us, about 200 kilometers. He's been wearing soft contacts, but his complaint was, I've never seen well, you know, and he was referred to me by another OD, specifically for a scleral lens. Um, and you can see here, this is, this is interesting. This is topography now. And you can see the, the right and left eyes. And to me, at first, his first glance, it looks like his left eye is the worst eye. It's a larger cone. It's more decentered um, than the right. But you can see from the Spectacle RX that that wasn't the case refractively. And so when we look a little deeper at the back surface, we can see you know, what, why this is the case. We have a Pentacam, which is a Scheinflu-based imaging system. Scheinflu camera takes, uh, takes a, a 3D uh, scan of the eye so we can see the rear elevation. And in comparing the two images, we can see why the right eye is actually worse. Uh, the elevation of the front and the back surfaces is, is greater. Uh, the K-Max is greater and his cornea is a lot thinner. So um, it's useful in these extreme cases to know what's going on, on the back surface uh, if you can have access to, to this type of equipment. Tom, I always feel like it's magical when we're looking at the back surface of the cornea because yeah, yeah. It, we pick up those early cases of keratoconus where it hasn't affected the front surface, but it tells us a yeah. lot using this technology. Exactly. And that's why that's why it's missed, Melissa. If you just have a keratometer um, or, or surface topographer, you're not seeing the back surface. So yeah, you're absolutely right. One thing that I've uh, become a lot more aware of in my fitting of scleral lenses uh, versus versus soft or, or the gas perms even is how much difference elevation makes. And elevation maps, if you're not familiar with them, are different than your topographical maps. In a typical topographical map, uh, you know, the blue area is the flatter area or less curvature, and the red is the steeper. But in, ele in elevation or profile maps, uh, th that's reversed. So you can see that you're looking here, the cone is the elevated part, it's flatter, so it, it's in red, and the blue is the steeper part. The blue is below the best fit sphere. So Going talking about front service and back service, you can see that even though this is a pretty advanced keratoconus, particularly in the right eye, the the elevated parts line up between the front and the back, and so your chances of a good visual outcome are, are improved with this kind of configuration. But in the next slide, we'll see it's that's not the case. You have a more severe case, um, and you can see that very distorted. And these are elevation maps, and you can see that there's really no rhyme or reason to the posterior elevation. And so this person may not, you know, have as good a visual acuity. So you have to be guarded in your prognosis. We love scleral lenses, um, but sometimes they don't give you as good a vision as maybe in, in other cases where, where a corneal lens may be more appropriate. And you can see that in this gentleman's shine flug image. You can see how irregular it is, how off-center it is. Uh, if you look at the arch there in, in, the, in the middle, that's his cornea, of course, and where it's uh, white, that's scarring. And scarring will scatter light and, and affect your vision as well. So this is a more severe case. Happily, we did fit this particular gentleman in an eye print lens, and, and he did quite well. But I think going back to our gentleman, our salesman, um, we fit him a couple of years ago, and he liked him, and he did well. Uh, but lately, the left lens was bothersome. It, it wasn't as comfortable. And um, you can see that the sag was, it was a little different. Uh, these are my little drawings that I did. I always like to make drawings uh, because visually I can, I can see what's going on. So in order to center the lens, my plan was to increase the toricity in the haptic. 
And so again, following my own advice, removing the lens and staining the eye, you can see where there's some areas of impingement there. That would be on the flat meridian. You can see from my, my little drawing there, that would be the, where the flat meridian was. And the lens rode low, dropped down a little bit. And you can see where there's some abrasion on the superior uh, cornea. So this is what we need to address. Why does this happen? You know, why do lenses decenter? If you go back and think about your ocular anatomy, there's something called the spiral of Tillot. And that's a recognition that the extraocular muscles insert at different distances from the limbus. Not only are they at different distances, but the elevation of the sclera in those areas is different, which is why, as Melissa pointed out, scleral profilometry is, is, is so interesting to us and reveals so much. But the, your lenses tend to ride up nasally, and as they ride up nasally, they'll be pushed down inferior temporally. Very, very good study was done, I believe, in 2017 uh, by Greg Denier and his group uh, in Ohio in the United States, where he observed, uh, they, they observed um, the surface patterns in 140 patients. And look what they found. Only 6% were regular, eight, uh, you know, eight were regular. 40, 40 patients or almost 29% were toric regular, and that would be what we consider with the rule or against the rule, where a steeper uh, meridian was observed vertically or horizontally. But a full uh, over 60% had no pattern at all. They had asymmetric high and low points, or they weren't, they weren't adjacent. So that's a lot. And so this is why our lenses tend to decenter, and this is why we're using more and more tericity in the landing zone. Uh, of the lenses of the, or what we call the haptic. It's a, it was a great study. Oh, yeah, I definitely agree. And their follow-up study as well in 2019. But I do want to bring up Simone Visser's work that she did on toric scleral lenses. And of course, we're talking about the back surface tericity here, where she examined eyes that were fit with spherical back surface haptics and those who had back surface toric haptics. And what they did is they actually rotated the lens on the eye and they saw and determined how long it took to go right back into position. And from that initial study, it demonstrated that patients like the vision and the comfort and the wearing time with lenses that included back surface haptics. And that was really instrumental to get a lot of these studies going and a scleral lens design is based off of that study, which I always love when we have these studies and now we have lens designs and now we have profilometry where we can base lenses off of. So there, there are many studies out there that are, are looking at scleral shape and it's just, it's so interesting to me and also how scleral shape varies between ethnicities and between different eyes. And I just think of the future of scleral lenses that we have a lot of opportunity to make lenses custom. So even if they're, you know, if you, even if you don't have a scleral profilometer, perhaps if there's a certain ethnicity that you're fitting, you might have a special set. And there are a few of those available now. Yeah, that was landmark work. And it's really interesting that this, re, this is the study here uh, that, that were referenced uh, from the Journal of Contact Conduct Lens and Research and Science. You know, it's really interesting, Melissa, you know, you and I are, are good friends with some of the pioneers like Donald Ezekiel uh, and, and the Boston Boston people. You know, the, the full diameter scurls often had a spherical haptic. They were so large, uh, they were spherical because they really couldn't fit you know, the, the touristy out there way out in the scar. As we become smaller and, and, and gone to smaller diameters like 16 and 17, uh, we encounter the lumps and bumps that we were discussing earlier. And uh, we're landing on a smaller area. So we have to align better. We don't have this huge lens, um, um, you know, where, where it's more forgiving. So this information is a lot more important. Uh, and these studies are, are very useful to us. And it's really fun to, as you say, the, uh, the technology follows the study and makes, makes our life easy and makes our patients more comfortable. So uh, again, talking about tools, um, there's some online tools. A lot of labs have these now where you can put in the lens you have 
uh, in this case in row A, and then say, well, these are the changes I want to make. Uh, and then you can see uh, what falls out of that are the exact parameters uh, of, of the new lens. And you can see a comparison in the graph there um, about what the current lens looks like and what the new lens will look like. And there's something called uh, the primary functional sagittal depth. There's a, there's a movement among a lot of different practitioners all around the world to standardize the terminology. Many, uh, it's confusing, especially for new fitters, because the different sets are named differently. They call their curvatures different names. They use different uh, um, ways of measuring. Some are in degrees, some are in steps, some are in actual microns. Um, and so the primary functional scleral depth is really the, the depth that you're trying to achieve in fitting your lens. And there's some calculators out there will help you uh, understand where that is. That's the number um, of actual clearance there. Uh, this came from an article a couple of years ago by a very, very esteemed team. Uh, so I, I would refer that article to you. Uh, and it's, it's very, very good. We need to start talking the same language, no matter what lens we're fitting. I always talk about this terminology like blue jeans. You know, we have different brands and different sizes and the same size is really different in different brands. But it's very important because it, it can be very confusing when fitting scleral lenses. And it's always good to start with, say, one or two companies that you're familiar with and really understand their lenses. But right now, there are many different terms for the same thing in different lens designs. So standardizing the terminology is really important. Exactly. So this is what we're trying to achieve, you know, an even fit, uh, uh, what we call a Plano fluid reservoir, which was, uh, which is the new term, I think, uh, for what we used to call the post lens tier reservoir. So this is what I want to achieve. And, and we did, let me show you how we did it in this case. Um, and we made the design changes. That's, that's what we ended up with. So I, I, I simply gave him more, I increased the sagittal clearance in his left eye a little bit, and I gave him more tericity. And what these studies show that Melissa and I have been talking about is that the sclera is a lot more torque and asymmetrical um, than we first thought. So having a haptic or a landing zone, whatever you want to call it, um, on the order of uh, you know, 200, 250, 300 in a mid-diameter lens like this one of about 16 microns is not out of the ordinary at all. Wouldn't you say so, Melissa, that you could probably put 150 microns of tericity on anybody? Oh, yeah, for the most part, except for the, you know, 5.7% of patients. But yeah, exactly. We've learned, exactly. we've learned a lot, you know, we've learned a lot lot in our in our years of fitting because years ago we only had spherical haptics and yeah. now you know just a rule of thumb very few of our lenses should be fit spherical yeah. at all so I, oh, a good yeah. friend, so think, oh go ahead yeah, a good friend of yours and mine and your co-author in, in your excellent text uh, lynette johns I remember uh, meeting her many years ago and listening to her lecture, and she was saying something. This is like seven or eight years ago. She said 95% of her lenses have a toric haptic, and I just went, wow, really? That's crazy. At that time, maybe only half of mine did, uh, but she uh, she recognized what we've been talking about this evening tonight. Yeah. Definitely. Another thing that's uh, interesting in talking about eyes and curvature is, uh, is it keratoconus or is it pellucid marginal degeneration? Um, and I was taught uh, in my studies that when you have something like a, a map like this, you know, a, an elevation map or an, uh, this is a K reading map. Uh, but look at this, look, kissing doves or crab claw, that's pellucid. But guess what? That's that's not the true definition. Uh, it's not kissing doves or crab call or whatever you want to call it. Uh, another friend of ours, um, Chris Sitt, and I published this article a couple of years ago about the difference, clinical differentiation between. And so it's not 
the definition is on the band of thinning of the cornea. It's not on the topographic map. And I think in my next picture, I, I, I illustrate that. Um, actually, this is Michael Bellin, who is um, one of the people that, that worked a lot with Pentacam. And what he says is that, you know, curvature is reference based and you have an asymmetric pattern uh, that, that, that can occur in a normal cornea when the corneal apex, the line of sight and the measurement axis don't add up. And that's where you get these odd maps. But that is not the definition of, of PMD. So this is um, when your pachymetry, that is your measurement of corneal thickness, shows a band of thinning one to two millimeters from the inferior limbus. That this is this is uh, PMD or pellucid marginal degeneration. Uh, it's much rarer than we thought. Only one to two percent of patients that, that have this type of ectasia actually have PMD. So you don't diagnose this off your corneal maps, your axial or, or sagittal maps, you diagnose it off global pachymetry. But it is a frustrating condition. It's important to realize because the steepest part, the most elevated part is above the thin part. And so your lenses tend to decenter and you tend to have a lot of fluid reservoir underneath this, this area. So you can see that this is the corneal thickness or pachymetry uh, of this patient. And you can see it doesn't meet the definition of that band of thinning. This is just a very low cone, which is quite typical of many of the cones we see. I love getting central cones because they're easy to fit and their vision's good. It's these guys that drive you crazy. So a tip that I found for the pellucid folks is really to go a little bit smaller in diameter. I find if I can just tuck it in a little bit inferiorly, it helps. Um, to center the lens a little bit better, but they can be quite challenging. You know, I can think of one cornea right now where for about a year, I was so worried about it in this one spot on the left eye. I was so concerned um, that the lens was actually clearing and it was centering. And I think now that we have better technology, I could do a, I could do a better fit. We've actually talked about that. So, the, but going a little smaller, and it's, by smaller, I mean like a 15.4 or so um, yeah. from a 18 or 17 or 16. Definitely. And another thing too, what you mentioned earlier, which I totally agree with, a lot of good studies on this is that the limbus is often oval. And so, you know, that, that may be, that in that case, you may have a shorter VVID vertical uh, visible as diameter. And if you can make that optical zone oval, you'll, you'll tuck it in a little bit better, I think, and make it easier to fit. So that's, yeah, it's both. So my other case here is something also very typical, uh, a normal cornea, but she had this scarring uh, from, uh, frankly, abusing her soft contact lenses. And she had dry eye disease, and she lives on the coastal community here in Texas. So windy, sandy, she's a smoker. Um, and just she had good vision, but a lot of uh, residual stigmatism and dry eyes. So you can see, again, going to her, let's look at her elevation map. Again, you can see that the cornea would be fairly normal through the, through the central part, but she has where the scar is, uh, there's a deep, deep um, recession, uh, if you will, of her cornea. So you can see that she can see 2020, but she had this oblique uh, astigmatism in the left eye. So we did take the sagittal height, we measured that, and we measured her horizontal visible iris diameter. And this is another example of, of profilometry, like you were talking about, uh, Melissa. This, this particular instrument is the, our Scheinflug camera again. It's a rotating camera, takes 25 images and goes out and give us, gives us the map uh, of the scleral zones. And you can see here that she's steeper horizontally and, and flatter vertically. So you always want to know uh, what the horizontal visible iris diameter is. Because in any, um, in any given fitting set, they will have the recommended lens size. So we call this fitting, fitting by the numbers. So in this instrument, uh, 
what they call the horizontal white to white, or which we would call horizontal visible iris diameter. So 11.6 is very, very typical. So we're going to fit a lens of a typical uh, overall diameter of 15.6. And again, going back to what we talked about, the functional lens depth, in this particular instrument, you can, if you know where the lens lands, you know, because your lens doesn't land out on the very edge, it lands somewhere inside that landing zone. Uh, and so this case, uh, this lens lands at 13.6. So that you want to know the mean sagittal height at where it lands. That's the base from where you're measuring the elevation from. And when you're fitting a diagnostic lens, you have to have a what we call a fudge factor of I, I don't want the I don't want to sit on the cornea. I want to clear the cornea. And 300 is a good good number to shoot for because there's many studies that have shown within about an hour uh, you're going to lose about 75 to 100 microns of that clearance. So I take the first number, the mean sagittal height, add 300, and that is my diagnostic lens. Yeah, right. And so uh, I go to a calculator, like we saw earlier, and I say, okay, if I fit, fit, pick an average lens from my set, which measures 4,600, and I, cal I do my calculation, what is that primary functional sagittal depth going to be? And as you can see here, uh, it's going to be too much. I only need 3655, and this particular lens is going to give me 3,800. So I go back to the drawing board. Pick another lens, drop it down that 150. I did an over refraction here uh, of my first lens uh, of minus 50. And when we calculate the numbers again, it comes out uh, that my primary functional sagittal depth now is 3670. And that is right on the money. So we can use these tools, these calculators to achieve a good fit, you know, right off the bat. Uh, and that lens will fit well, they'll see well, and the chances of having multiple remakes uh, are lessened and you get a happier patient. Exactly. And we do realize that not everyone has scleral prophylometry. I feel very fortunate of having it. So I'm going to present a different case, which is using a diagnostic lens. So this is a 60-year-old male. He came in wearing a corneal gas permeable lens in the right eye. His vision was was fine. However, the lens kept falling off and obviously at the wrong times when he needed to see, which is all the time. He had tried scleral lenses elsewhere, but really couldn't get an adequate fit. And of interest, he, his father had a history of keratoconus and wore scleral lenses in the 1950s. So here you can see uh, in the right eye, he was 20-20 with that GP lens. He was counting fingers in that left eye without correction. He did have highly irregular astigmatism in both eyes. You can see the endothelial cell count here around 1200 of each eye, which I thought was adequate to fit the lenses. And his HVID was 12, which is a little bit on the larger side. So he had a type of protruding graft where you walk into the room, you see a patient, you're like, yep, you've had, a, you've had a graft. I can see it from here, from across the room. So it's more protruding left eye than right eye. He did have some meibomian gland dysfunction, also some cataracts, which it's good to keep in mind anything that could affect vision. So the lens, it could be the retina, if they have macular degeneration, but I always like to know what to expect and what to tell my patient for their best corrected vision. So we talked about different management options for the meibomian gland dysfunction using an eyelid cleaner, compresses, omegas, artificial tears, and talked about different scleral lens options. So here you can see his cornea and the protruding graft. So I started to fit him knowing that he tried a scleral lens elsewhere and was not successful with this lens diagnostic lens, which is unique for each eye, the right eye and the left eye. And I put a lens on and had touch with the lens. With the over refraction, the vision was 20, 20 minus two. But when a lens is touching, it's hard to know how much it's touching touching versus a lens that is clearing, it's easy to measure it or estimate it to reduce the amount of clearance. 
And this patient did report improvement in vision and the lens felt very comfortable. So on the left eye, um, again, kind of a similar situation, um, put a lens on, getting some touch, but I ordered some lenses. I said, let's, let's give it a try. Let's increase the sag quite a bit, but all the lenses had touch yet again. So then I had some new diagnostic lenses, increased 400 microns, and the lenses had touch. So then I ordered a pair of lenses with 800 microns, increased central clearance off of those diagnostic lenses compared to the original lenses. And I was happy and the patient was happy that the lenses were clearing the cornea and they were not touching. Yay. So this was a 19 millimeter diameter lens. He was seeing 2020 and we were absolutely thrilled with the fit. I was thrilled with the fit. He was happy with the vision and also the comfort. In the left eye, also 2020 vision, happy with the lenses, and he is still to this day uh, doing quite well. In 2020, we published an article um, about this lens specifically and showed that a more customized lens is very helpful. Now in 2021, there are some new diagnostic fit kits that have become available with two different diameters based off of data and that have those built-in oval optic zones. We were talking about that earlier. There's also the option for higher order aberration correction with this technology. Now, when we're fitting scleral lenses, it's so important to review solutions and to review solutions with our patients at every visit. Think on scleral lens practitioners, Tom, that's probably one of the most common questions is solutions in the front surface and what patients are using. And definitely on the patient sites, I would say solutions is the number one question. But I would recommend whenever the patient comes in is to review solutions application solutions, disinfection and storage solutions, and also additional cleaners. This is a, a nice. Um, handout that just came out uh, in 2020 from the Scleral Lens Society and the Dry Eye Shop in conjunction. And you can just actually circle or, or recommend uh, something specific for your patients. And if you have different solutions, I would recommend creating a similar handout and giving patients information. So in the US, we have these available solutions at this time. Sodium chloride nebulizer solution is an off-label product that can be obtained both with and without prescription. My, my sort of issue with this, and I'd love to hear your take, Tom, is that sometimes it's fine, um, but other times the batch is, is, is off. So I don't know if it's the pH or something that's different in that one batch. So years ago, I would have patients coming in and all around the same time using the same sort of batch where they'd have toxicity on the cornea. Have you seen that, Tom, in your experience? Yes, yes, I do from time to time. And since we have now FDA approved solutions, uh, that's what we recommend. But exactly. uh, that, those, those nebulizer saline has been done for years um, and I think that the, the PA, I think they're not stable pH wise, which is why maybe they cause some burning. Yeah. And so now we have FDA approved solutions and I have them lift, listed here. So Lacropure is a solution that does not have any buffers in it. It comes in five ML vials. Sclerophyll is a buffered solution and it comes in 10 ml vials. We actually did a study on this solution and demonstrated that it was helpful for patients with dry eye. Neutrophil is unique because it has electrolytes within the solution. It comes in 10 ml vials and I have some more information on the next slide here. Vibrant View scleral saline was recently approved. It does not have any buffers and it comes in 5 ml vials. And then Pure Lens, which comes in a bottle, is also FDA approved 4 ml bottle, but that it does have to be replaced within 15 days. A very important thing for all lenses is not to rinse them with water at all because of the risk of acanthamoeba. 
So this study came out in 2020, uh, Jenny Fote and group excellent study that looked at neutrophil solution that has potassium, calcium, and magnesium in it. It's a phosphate buffered solution and patients noticed an improvement in burning, stinging, grittiness, form, body sensation, dryness, blurry and fluctuating vision, and overall preferred this solution, which is really uh, unique compared to other solutions. Brian Tompkins came up with this great idea out of the UK for having labels on solutions. So clean, store, fill to make it extremely clear for what the solutions are for. Because I know both of us have seen over the years, patients doing all sorts of things with solutions and doing crazy things with solutions. So I thought this was a really good idea that he had. Of course, for scleral lenses, they do need to be disinfected and cleaned every night. There are various cleaners, both hydrogen peroxide and multi-purpose solutions. Sometimes I'll have my patient use two or give them two solutions, one to use for overnight and one to use, say, midday if they need to take a nap or something like that. They can take the lens out, put it in the case, and then put it in later. It is important not to use anything abrasive uh, because it can actually, it has silica in it like is in toothpaste and it can take off surface coatings on the lens. Training and reviewing and reviewing again, the importance of application and removal is so important. So for all patients, there's a great video for the Scleral Lens Society that I have them watch. When they come back after that they've been trained, I like to ask them if they're having any problems at all. And if they are, then we do a quick review one more time just on application and removal. There are many different devices and different options to help patients apply and remove scleral lenses. And I think patients have gotten incredibly creative. For example, the, the device here on the bottom right, you can see my patient actually created this himself. He made his own light that he puts his lens on with. We do have conventional things um, like the DMV inserters here. We have O-rings that can be used. But I would encourage you, if you have a scleral lens practice, to have a variety of these tools in your practice because different patients have different needs. Of course, you can use an upside down cup and put a hole in it and use that to put, put a lens on. Patients are so incredibly creative with this. So we do want to thank you for your time and your attention. We want to thank you for having us here today and we'll open it to any questions that you might have. All right, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Barnett and Dr. Arnold. I think it was very comprehensive. Thank you for sharing uh, you know, the cases. That's really important because you went ahead on a case where you utilize the advanced technology on you know how to go about which is probably available in that side of the world and then we looked at the case where you if you don't have an access to you know the technology you can still go ahead and do better fitting so i think that's uh, that's very uh, useful thank you so much i was very happy that you you know commented on the topographic map comparison between the anterior and the posterior uh, mapping that really gives us an idea on uh, the the post fitting vision quality which probably we might get so that's something uh, which is uh, thank you for sharing that with us i think we probably miss out on looking at the posterior surface corneal mapping and that's where as you mentioned uh, most of the keratoconus are diagnosed at probably a later stage uh, as one of your case as well right yeah. Yes, that's that's true. Yeah, that, that, that's where it starts on the back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, oh. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to answer the question here in the chat. Um, yeah, I'm just putting up on the, oh, on the screen. Oh, okay. you, can, you can just, uh, you know, have a look. So somebody has asked on, uh, you know, can you tell us some tips on, uh, you know, prognosis and fitting on from first day keratoconus? If you have any, uh, you know, some tips to add on what we should look for and, you know, uh, how we should go about fitting sclerals for these patients. Sure. So I, I'll start and then Tom, you can chime in here. So in these early cases, um, 
One thing, of course, to discuss is corneal cross-linking. So if you have the option to cross-link these patients prior to any progression, that is important to do first. So any keratoconus just in general, if we can get them cross-linked um, to prevent progression. And I'm going to share just a real quick story of a patient I saw last uh, Monday. And we get these patients all the time, but it reminds me how scleral lenses change lives. So she was a 19 year old new to me, never had seen her before. She was cross-linked in one eye, progressive keratoconus. And was I asked if she was in school or what she was doing. And she said that she was listening to her classes online because she couldn't see anything. She couldn't read anything because her vision was so poor and it was about 2,400. So I fit her actually with scleral lenses. She was 2025 in that cross-linked eye, which had a little haze in it, 2020 in the other eye. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. You know, scleral lenses completely are going to change her life for the better, like starting as soon as she gets them, because she can do whatever she wants. She can be in school. She can see everything she wants to. But my second part of that was going back to the corneal specialist and saying, we need to cross-link her other eye. She's 19. She's progressive. I'm worried about this patient. And so we had that conversation last week. But informed fresh keratoconus, they're actually easier to fit. So they're, they're more mild and they're less advanced. And so you could go smaller in diameter. You can use whatever you know, tools or fitting sets or technology that you might have. But I actually find these cases to be the, the easy cases when fitting scleral lenses. They can sometimes do quite well in other lenses, a soft toric lens, a hybrid lens, a corneal GP, even glasses. So those are the easy patients, I think, um, compared to the other patients. But I'd say watch them closely and cross-link early if you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that, uh, Melissa. Uh, lots of times, as you said, the, the anterior service may be quite regular. And so a, 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 my tip would be, what is their best corrected vision you know, in spectacles or like say the soft lens? Because if the anterior surface is relatively normal and, and you have this ectasia on the back, scarls don't necessarily give you better vision. You know, if they're, if they can, correct to 2030, 2025 in spectacles, you have to be careful uh, about putting a scar lens on or over promising. Um, I think I've read various studies that, you know, you have positive aberrations on the front surface of the cornea, you have negative on the back. And lots of times and, and about 60% of the negative aberrations on the back are corrected by aberrations on the front. When you put a scar lens over that, you, you neutralize everything. So sometimes your vision is actually worse because the scar lens has have uniformly taken care of all aberrations, positive and negative. So, so kind of be careful. I, I agree. I, I'm for whatever gives them the best vision. It may be glasses. It may be a soft lens. It, it may be a, you know, a corneal lens. So and yeah, you but if they're young and they're, they're progressing, do it. Mm -hmm. um, you bring up a good point about the importance of checking a refraction for patients when they're referred, because that makes all the difference in the world. If a patient is pretty happy and they're seeing 2030 or 2025 with glasses and they're referred for scleral lens fitting, and I think, okay, I, I know that I want to correct their higher order operations. And, you know, some people have aberrometers, other people don't have access to them. It, it is possible that the vision is not improved with scleral lenses versus someone who comes in and they're 2400, then it's easy to get them better most of the time with scleral yeah. lenses. And, and if it's a, a mild amount of anterior ectasia, don't forget about we have several uh, different types of soft lenses for keratoconus specific for that. And so that may be, you know, um, an intermediate step. Uh, a quarterly replacement soft lens because some of these go, I think, plus or minus 30 and 10 diopters of astigmatism, you know, every yeah. three. So yeah, don't, don't forget about your toolbox. You know, I find they're really helpful just having the, the soft lenses for keratoconus, especially in the earlier cases or those who are a bit more mild as well. That's right. Okay. So thank you so much for your uh, inputs.
And just another question here. Uh, you did mention about PMD. I think that was a really an eye opener as well. So don't just look at the axial uh, keratographic maps. I think you must also uh, make sure about the pachymetry before you even diagnose or you know consider your patient as uh, a pellucid. So the question is like, uh, how is it important clinically? Do you consider PMD and keratoconus both as uh, the same spectrum of ectasia? Or would you go about, you know, uh, looking at them separately? So one of the tip I got is like PMD, probably you might have to put, fit smaller diameter lenses. That's what I, I could understand. And if you would want to add on anything on that. Well, I'll, I'll go here because I know Anith uh, Palai and he's a, he's a friend of mine and he's a fellow Texan. So uh, it's a great question. Uh, and, you know, is it clinically relevant? Well, as, Mo, as Melissa said, and you pointed out, um, you may have to go smaller and, and tuck in there. I think, I think it's a, the, the main thing is that to describe to the patient that they're more complex and if they've been a previous scleral lens failure or a hybrid failure or something like that, just know that this is maybe a more difficult case. Depending on the severity of the pellucid, uh, you, you may be talking about a custom lens like Melissa was talking about with an eye print or several of these profilometers, if you have access to that, can make you a custom lens off the profilometer itself. So I, I would say it may be a more challenging case visually and to fit and just to let the patient know. Uh, and again, not over promise and, and maybe not go simple. Say this is going to require to work, not to not to discourage the patient, but just let them know this is um, this is a, a, a more difficult case. Fortunately, as I said, in my practice, uh, it's a rich, rare, real pellucid is, is quite rare. So we don't see it as far as is it is it different pathologies or is it the same spectrum? Uh, there's a different etiology with them. Keratoconus tends to start very young. And, and as people mature into their 20s and 30s, it kind of halts. I think PMD can start later and keep changing later. So in that way, it, it's more severe. Whether they're the same or different, um, I, I think that's something that's highly debatable among anatomists um, and, and so forth. So it really doesn't, it's an anatomy question. What do you, what do you and, think, Melissa? Yeah, and I'll, um, I'll chime in on, you know, I, th I think that they could, I, I agree with you, Tom, it's a huge question and perhaps it is a spectrum, but I will share, it's important to understand that where the patient is coming from. And when we're fitting scleral lenses, there's so much empathy that we need to employ and talk to them. And I have a few patients that come in and they say, I have PMD and they you know, they don't, they have keratoconus, but I try not to, I, I don't pick that battle with them. And sometimes I'll just put both diagnoses in there because if they have been told for 20 years that they have PMD and they're referred to me at, to fit them with scleral lenses, I'm still going to fit them with a scleral lens, um, regardless of the diagnosis. And I've had a few this past year that were so adamant. And I thought, well, you know, I go over their pentacam with them and I talk about their shape, but they're, they're not going to change their mind on what they have. And so that's fine. I'm still going to fit them. I'm still going to do the best. And we just sort of, I, I talk about the shape of their cornea more than saying yeah. if they have PMD or yeah. don't have yeah. Clinically, I don't care, you know, what you call it, you know, you, you still are going to fit them with something. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And as, as experts, I think the, the, the ball is in your court. You need to fit them with scleras and you just go ahead, uh, you know, yeah. fit them with scleras as well. Just that the modifications you need to keep in mind on our end, which probably the patient may not be required to know. So I'm just going to the next question. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, abrasions and relation to keratoconus. Uh, anything uh, uh, which which is to scleral lenses and IOP? Any 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 ideas or thoughts on that? So do you have another three hours? <laughs> <laughs> you you, ta you take this one, Melissa. Okay. Uh, so this is another lecture. Um, that's not that's more than an hour uh but i'll i'll sum it up there have been multiple studies 
uh, looking at scleral lens and intraocular pressure. Some studies say that it raises intraocular pressure. Other studies say that it lowers intraocular pressure, doesn't change intraocular pressure. I think we're learning um, right now. There are, there's more than IOP, of course. We need to look at the nerve. We need to look at so many things when we're talking about glaucoma. My personal recommendation is if you have a patient who is a suspect for glaucoma, family history of glaucoma, a history of ocular hypertension or someone who does have glaucoma to check their pressure. And you could check it when the lens is removed or if you have the technology, you can check the pressure when the lens is on. So I think we need to have caution in this category, um, but this is definitely a, a much longer lecture, but there have been many, many excellent studies um, on this, even many in the, in the year 2020 alone. Okay, okay. I think that would be probably our homework to go and read on those papers and, you know, uh, get our thoughts uh, together and maybe we can think about doing uh, a proper session for that particular topic in the nearby future. <laughs> All right. Uh, a couple of more questions here. So this is one question. I think uh, uh, you did mention a lot about this in terms of care and maintenance and you discussed a lot. Uh, probably it relates to that. And, you know, the patient is uh, having foreign body sensation, can only wear for short hours, like five to six hours. So any tips on uh, recommending uh, for these patients for long wearing hours? So what would you normally go about doing this? Sure. So I, I would really look at the landing of the lens. And if you have the opportunity to measure with scleral prophylometry, it's probably due to fit um, more than solutions. So if it is, you know, you can always add something more viscous, um, a thicker drop in the bowl of the lens, something like Cellevisc or Oasis Plus, um, but it's probably more to do with the fit of the lens. It could be that you need to decrease the amount of clearance, that there's too much. It could be the lens diameter is not quite right. It's too small, too large, um, but, but lens, scleral lenses should be really, really comfortable and they should be comfortable all day long, all waking hours long. There's a real good paper recently by uh, Stephen Vincent from uh, Queensland Technological University in Brisbane, who uh, Melissa and I both know, and, and he does great, great work. And his, his study was talking about discomfort. And he found in his study that if you, you don't want to be too close to the limbus, uh, we, we, you know, we don't want to impinge on the limbus. If we get too much clearance over the limbus, that's when we get the conjunctival prolapse. But he found in his study uh, that you need uh, an adequate amount of clearance over the limbus. The limbus is a sensitive area. Uh, and, and I would definitely be, be looking at that area. And also, uh, you're right about solutions, uh, Melissa, I agree with you, but you got to be careful about the solutions because people may you know, go to the pharmacy and get some soft lens solution with preservatives and fill it up and, and use it. Uh, so it uh, goes back to taking the lens off and staining the cornea and, and yes, seeing if, if they have an SPK, then that might be a solution sensitivity, just not because it's a scleral, but because they're using the wrong solution. Right. And one more thing on preservative free solutions is that they're preservative free. So it's important to replace them after single use. Uh, all the cases of infiltrative keratitis I've seen in clinic have been from reusing the solution. And there is a new study coming on looking at microbial keratitis in scleral lens wearers but that's really important to go over solutions for each time. So say if a patient was using the same solution on the second day, then they could have discomfort over time. Yeah. The other thing too about foreign body sensation is a lot of these people, uh, they have multiple issues. A lot of them have meibomian gland dysfunction. A lot of them have some sort of blepharitis or demodex or just bad tears. I mean, they, they have multiple things. So don't forget we get hung up on focusing on the lens and the fit and the landing zone, but look at the whole adnexa, you know, look at the lids, you know, do they look nasty or the glands inspissated, you know, lid hygiene is a big part of scleral lens success. 
And then just one more thing to add on to this is any sort of systemic flares of a patient has Sjogren's or allergies or whatever it might be, and they're having a flare and their scleral lenses were comfortable and now they're not comfortable, I like to ask if they're having a flare. And they say, oh, yes. And then I ask the timing of their flare when that started, and it tends to correspond with the timing of discomfort as well. Um, yeah, great point. Yeah. And, and, and just to increase their comfort, would you probably add on an artificial tears on top of the lens? Would that, would that be your choice of preference in any of the cases? It's not going to hurt, but it doesn't tend to help a lot because there's it, it, a very little amount will go in. So if it's not a front surface poor wetting issue, it's fine to use a preservative free artificial tear, but it might not do a lot. So I'd look at all the fitting first and the solutions prior to using artificial tears. And I agree with Tom, uh, treating the eyelids to the maximal level. So including meibomian gland dysfunction, blepharitis, demodex blepharitis, it's really important. And I like to add in omegas to reduce the inflammation. We could do expression. Um, it is really, really important to look at those eyelids. That's right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, one last question uh, before uh, we leave. And uh, this is related to, again, choice of scleral lenses as well. So there's a patient who has uh, diagnosed keratoconus, has underwent uh, cross-linking, and uh, he's, he's a RGP contact lens wearer. Do you think the patient will experience better vision if we change him to scleral lenses? Any takes on that? I'm happy to start. Or, and Tom, you can chime in too. So it depends. Um, so that's a common question, um, the difference between RGP and scleral lenses if there is improved vision. So if the corneal gas permeable lens is fitting well, it's centered, and the patient's ocular surface is in good shape, um, maybe not. If the patient has scarring after cross-linking or if they have dry eyes, then yes, a scleral lens is going to help. So it really is sort of more of the picture, um, the whole picture of the eye, and to see with comfort if vision will be better. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. Uh, we don't know what this patient's seeing with their RGP. If it's adequate and well fit, there is nothing wrong with a well fit RGP. I love them. I think they're beautiful. Um, uh, simpler to take care of, a lot less expensive. So if it's working, stay with it. Uh, I wouldn't go with the scleral per se, um, you know, unless you had a significant reason. So not necessarily. Yeah, I think the, uh, probably sometimes uh, the conception is that keratoconus is equal to scleral lenses, which gives the best vision, which is uh, probably people think that way because I know scleral lenses are wonderful. But then again, you talked about this uh, during your presentation that you need to look at the eye and then decide whether this eye needs a scleral lens or it can go ahead with soft lens or RGP. So there is the toolbox. I like your word, Dr. Tom, your toolbox. You should look at your toolbox and see which one fits the best. And, uh, you know, that could help uh, you as a practitioner as well as the patient, right? Yeah, and corneal GPs are, are a great tool. That's right, yeah. And uh, uh, I'm just reading the chat. One question, I'll just take that up. Uh, this is regarding the notch marking, which we, uh, which we talked about in the beginning. So do you recommend any specific marker pen or anything which comes with the company to be marked on or it's a Sharpie which we- It's just a Sharpie, right? <laughs> it's just a Sharpie. It's just a yeah, I, can, I can show you some really ugly pictures that I tried to draw and it looks pretty bad, but uh, uh, the lab got the idea. So, yeah. That's right. Okay. And uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I think we have taken most of the questions which were relevant. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Barnett and Dr. Arnold for doing this for us and uh, going us, uh, going, taking us through the case series and, you know, explaining us the advancement of uh, scleral lenses and also answering uh, most of the questions. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, most welcome. And uh, if you would just like us, uh, you know, to just tell us a few words about the the uh, the conference or the meeting, which is solely dedicated to scleral lenses for the attendees, if you may just uh, give us uh, some ideas. 
Sure. It is the International Congress of Scleral Contacts. Our website is icscmeeting.com, icscmeeting.com. Uh, it'll be our fifth annual meeting. Of course, we didn't have it this last year because of the COVID. It is in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we're going to have a live meeting. It's truly international. We have people coming from all over the world, speakers and attendees. It's two full days. It is Friday and Saturday, July 23rd and 24th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So uh, it's a great meeting, uh, a lot of fellowship. Uh, some of the greatest scale experts uh, from around the world will be there uh, and a chance for uh, you to see some of the technologies that we talked about this evening. We'll have vendors demonstrating uh, that we'll have workshops that you can attend. We'll have breakout sessions where you can meet uh, in a very small group with with some of the true es experts and scar lenses in the world. So uh, please go to our website, icscmeeting.com uh, and register. And you're all invited. So we have yeah. personal invitation from us. Thank you. Thank you so much. To have a, a, a meeting just solely for scleral lenses is something which is very unique in, in that sense as well. So we do have meetings uh, of the overall optometry perspective, but this is something very solely to scleral lenses. So practitioners who are into scleral lenses, I think this meeting is, is something which you should be looking forward to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Most welcome. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. We do have session planned the next weekend. Take care, be safe, and to those who are celebrating, uh, you know, uh, the new year, a uh, very happy Chinese New Year or a very happy Lunar New Year to you. Uh, and also it, it happens to be, it will be Valentine's Day. So those who are celebrating Valentine's Day, uh, I wish you a very happy Valentine's Day as well. Thank you everyone for attending. Take care, be safe, and I'll see you again next uh, weekend. Bye-bye.